Hi, this is Josh Marshall, and this is the Josh Marshall Podcast. It's a special edition of the Josh Marshall Podcast. We are recording Monday afternoon, uh, Monday, August the 16th, which is the day after the fall of Kabul. That's, uh, you know, it sounds like kind of a grandiose uh, way to put it, but that is what happened. Um, as, as you certainly know, uh, over a period of really less than a week, uh, the Afghan government and the Afghan National Army, which the U.S. has been uh, creating, training up, funding, uh, and propping up for really the last 20 years. It's not, it's not quite 20 years because the U.S. went into Afghanistan, I don't know the exact month, but it was uh, maybe December 2001, you know, a couple months after, I don't know, six weeks after the 9-11 attacks. Um, and that is uh, just a few months shy of 20 years ago. Um, like many of you, I remember it uh, not quite like it was yesterday, but it wasn't that long ago. And yet it was 20 years ago. And this has been happening all of this time. And as we saw, uh, the Afghan government, the Afghan National Army, could not survive first contact with a post-U.S. military reality. And, uh, you know, these are these are shocking images that we're seeing. Um, they are, some of them are really iconic images. Uh, and many people are seeing this as an example of the, you know, bad decision to pull out, mismanaged decision to pull out. Uh, you know, uh, people have different opinions. Uh, to me, and I've I've explained this in a number of posts on the site over the last forty eight hours or so. As messy, and as ugly, and as painful as it is, you know, painful in different ways for different people to see to see this happening. Everything that we have seen in the last thirty six to forty eight hours has confirmed to me how right this decision was. Not in some abstract sense of, you know, should we or should we not stay in Afghanistan forever? But this decision to pull out now. Because what I think we see is that, again, the entire thing we were there to do, supposedly, which was to incubate, build up a friendly or at least uh, non-extremist Islamist government in Afghanistan that would, uh, you know, give safe haven to international terrorist groups, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That that whole enterprise was an illusion. The first moment the U.S. military was not there to prop the thing up, it collapsed. And not just the Afghan army, the whole Afghan state. It's funny, there, were, there was, um, and you know, got a million other things to say about this, and I've, I've said them on the site, so uh, you, can, you can go and see the posts there that I wrote over the weekend. Um, there was an article in the Washington Post that uh, it may have come, I think came out sometime overnight, and it basically explained that when the Trump administration basically made the deal they made last year to exit Afghanistan by a fixed date, and that fixed date was supposed to be in May, President Biden extended it out a few months until September, you know, kind of got done in August. Basically, from that point, the Taliban government started making agreements with local military commanders local government leaders in Afghanistan, um, sometimes with payoffs, often with payoffs, but basically saying, we know where this is going. So when the moment comes, don't fight us. And here's some money, here's some agreements, whatever. And that, I think, explains why this happened so rapidly. Now, 
one can look at that and say, well, look, Trump made the agreement. You know, Trump set the stage for this happening. It's Trump's fault. Well, that's fine to say in the context of Trump or someone else saying it's, it's Biden's fault, but really, it's not that. What it shows is, is that the first moment the U.S. military was not there, with a promise to stay there indefinitely, forever, there was no Afghan state. There was no Afghan military. So it's not Trump's fault. He kind of did halfway what Biden did the whole way, which was say, we're done. We're not doing this any longer. And when I saw this unfolding, um, when I saw this unfolding, like uh, like I'm sure you did, over the course of this weekend, a lot of people, understandably, very upset. Very upset at just what they're seeing. Very upset about the fate of people in Afghanistan who worked with us, who are now in danger. Upset about the fate of... Afghan civilians, especially women. And that all makes sense. And, and many upset with Joe Biden. Like, fine, we wanted to leave, but man, you really fucked it up. Like this was, some, somehow you screwed it up because this, we should not be seeing this. When I saw it, I, I think, like I, I think I said in a post, I, I must be one of the only people who became more sure this was the right decision the more I watched over the last 36 hours. Because crystal clear that the only thing we were doing there was pushing into the future indefinitely, dealing with the fact that what we had supposedly created over the last 20 years, with all the dollars, like a trillion dollars, all the suffering, Afghan civilian suffering, suffering of U.S. soldiers, the death of something like 2,300 soldiers over 20 years, and you know, countless traumatic brain injuries and, and maimed bodies. There was nothing there. And I found myself, at least, thinking, I'm glad Joe Biden had the decision, the decision to say, we're done with this. And when people pointed out, look, it's going to be ugly. This is going to happen. That's going to happen. And it, ha it clearly happened faster than a lot of people thought, faster than I thought. But to say, this is up to the people in Afghanistan. We're not doing this anymore. And I think he was right. And uh, that's my take on it. Uh, here with my co-host, Kate, of course. Uh, Kate, you have a... It's interesting. You know, look, I, I, I remember very clearly how we got into this. You know, the literal moment. You were obviously much younger. You have your own experience, not just your age, but, but you can share with us. Uh, what are you... What's your take on all this? Yeah, so... Yeah, I don't I don't have any cognizant memories of what got us into the war because I was in first grade when 9-11 happened. But yeah, um, my boyfriend's a, an Afghanistan veteran. So I think kind of the first thing that struck me on an emotional level when I saw this stuff, of course, is that, you know, the suffering of the people who are left behind. And like you say, Josh, that was going to happen now or was going to happen when we leave in the future, I think we can kind of reserve our opinions that it was right to leave and also feel, you know, tremendous heartbreak for the suffering that people will go will go through. But it also kind of, I think, makes me a bit angry at the reactions of people who do seem to be pushing for that side of things, the side of we should have stayed longer. You know, we should we can't leave these people defenseless because that is the kind of thing where that sounds noble when you phrase it like that. But that costs bodies that costs lives that, you know, these aren't it's not just like nameless, faceless soldiers who will be doing this work. I, and I think the people who advocate for that 
you know, it's like, are you going to be there? Are you going to be boots on the ground? Because it's people's lives. You know, you're asking for soldiers to go there and stay and potentially sacrifice their health or their lives for what? What's the mission? When are we leaving? What would be an accomplishment, you know? And as we've kind of seen over this weekend, it seems that there were never really those things. I don't know what we would have done there that would have that we would ever be done because if we were there just kind of propping this up and the minute we leave this is the end result i mean you know i'm still kind of organizing my thoughts about this but a big thing that i keep coming back to is shouldn't there be a lot of anger and rancor at george w bush right now that is really just not emerging in the debate very much it's you know most people are just trying to decide whether or not to blame biden when it seems to me he was kind of cleaning up the mess that someone else got us into 20 years ago, a a mess that there's no clean exit from at this point. Maybe there was never a clean exit from, but it at least would have made more sense to leave 18 years ago instead of now. It's funny. I actually, it's not a matter of respect. I mean, you know, who cares who respects who or whatever, but I can at least kind of have a conversation with people who say, look, in forever, yeah, we, the we need to be there. You know, ten years, fifty years. It, it's it, it's just uh, if we don't, this is going to happen. That is not good for us because of X, Y, and Z. And uh, can the country afford the dollars? Yeah. And can the country afford uh, the loss of life? I mean, again, I. We have for 20 years. I mean, that's just a decision someone can make. But at least there, I don't agree with that. But I can say, okay, I see what you're saying. I disagree because I just don't think that is that is what we should be doing as a country. What gets to me though is people saying, yeah, we should. We it 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 can't go on forever, but not like this, because I that that is not it. That is not an honest position in my mind. Well, I think that's code for what the first thing you said is, but people say that instead because they're not comfortable with dealing with the rebuttals, which will be, oh, cool. So would you be okay if your family member was stationed over there for the foreseeable future? Or would you be okay with just saying, hey, forever? Because here, here's the thing, because I saw a number of people like on social media today saying, oh, is it a forever war that we still have troops in, in Japan and Korea? And like, it is a kind of a, a – it's treated as accepted in conventional U.S. foreign policy thinking that, yeah, we have troops in Japan. They've been there for 70 years, and we have no intention of, of pulling them out kind of at any – you know, it's just indefinite. It's forever. Um, and is that a problem too? Well, <laughs> we're not involved in a counterinsurgency in Japan. Um, so, and, and I, so, but I guess my point is if someone is, if someone is willing to say, yeah, this is just a cost we have to bear because of X, Y, and Z, because, you know, Pakistan has nuclear weapons and it's an unstable state and we need to kind of be near there, keeping an eye out or because we need to create a kind of a modern democracy in Afghanistan. I disagree, but okay. That is so your perspective. We've been trying to do yeah. that for 20 years and I, nothing I, changed. I, I hear you. I hear I you. I'm, totally I'm agree. fighting I guess, with this person that you're making yeah, up no, through guess, you. <laughs> at least there, though, I, kind of like that is a position. And uh, okay, you know, I disagree, but that's your position. And it, uh, But as you say, most people are not willing to say, yeah, forever. Because that is a tough thing to say. Not just because, like you know, who's gonna, who's gonna be the kid who goes, um, but the money, or kind of like why are we doing this in the first place? If it's if it's forever, clearly it's not. We're not building much if we have to stay there forever. Um, but again, it's that it's it, it's the trying to have it both ways that, that gets to me at a deep level. And I will say this: look, clearly this is not, you know. <laughs> I don't think I'm going out on a limb to say the current situation is not a great one. I mean, and there are various ways that this immediate situation could have been improved. But I think what people are at least 
not reckoning with is that because the standard line is like, okay, yes, we needed to leave. We needed to leave now, but clearly you didn't manage it right. Right. You know, kind of, you didn't, you didn't get all the knobs and levers in the right place. I accept that it's, 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 it's not ideal, but I think what people miss there is because what I've heard is basically, you know, instead of having six, 7,000 troops go back in to sort of manage the evacuation, which is what is happening now, why didn't you just leave them there and evacuate everybody so it wouldn't be kind of, you know, rushed and chaotic? But the problem with that is, if you say, okay, we're leaving, and before we leave, we are evacuating everyone who ever said hi to us because they're going to be in danger. You can't do that because the second you do that, you are saying, we know the government is going to collapse the second we leave. And the second you say that, the government will collapse. So you're basically signing the death warrant of the, of the government. Now, as we can see, we signed it regardless. But I think people need to be frank with themselves to understand that you can't leave, you can't evacuate everybody in advance if you, if you are even going through the motions of pretending that you think the state will survive you know, more than a day or two before your departure. Now, I'm not saying you can't do better than we did, but that's tough because, again, when you say everybody's going to be out, you know, th- before we, le- you know, kind of pull any of our troops out, you're creating a fait accompli. That's harder than it sounds. And I'm not saying you can't criticize Biden's management of this, because look, he's the president. Buck stops with him. But people are not being honest with themselves if you don't think through those exigencies that I just described. Well, and I think the political dynamics around this are kind of important for us to spell out because this is the kind of story that, you know, the the mainstream media, kind of the, the biggies are particularly, I think, ill-equipped to deal with for a few reasons. First of all, I think it's always hard when a uh, foreign affair story suddenly becomes the lead news story and you have reporters who usually specialize in, like, you know, domestic politics writing about that foreign affairs event that maybe you're not steeped in or you don't have a history in. And then there's also, there is this, this both sides dynamic that we've kind of been calling out you know, for show after show at this point, which is, I think a lot of reporters were eager for a thing to be mad at Biden about, or for a thing to point out that Biden and his administration did wrong. And we've seen that kind of come in like in little silly ways throughout, uh, throughout the term so far, but this is kind of you can tell, you can read these pieces and the built-in opinion is that we should have stayed forever. That's the like underlying kind of built-in how they're, how a lot of these stories have been written. And I think that is an opinion, you know, that's not being both sides in this case. And then on top of it, now you have, of course, a lot of Republicans kind of flocking to the same opinion, saying that he bungled the pullout. Of course, we should have pulled out, but how could you have done it like this? You know, Trump calling for his resignation and then like kind of creating another an, a narrative that you have to put in the story if you're going to be both sides about it. Again, I'm not saying that there's nothing to criticize about the way that we pulled out. I'm not saying that I know the right way to do it. And I kind of agree with you, Josh, that was my initial impression as well of the situation. But you know, with this kind of both sides news environment that we have, there is a tendency, I think, that we've seen in these initial days, especially to pair the horrific, you know, the horrific images that we're seeing come from Afghanistan with Biden messed this up. This is Biden's fault. And there's not a ton of reckoning with is there was there a way to do this? that wouldn't have looked like this? Or was this going to always be the inevitable end of the war in Afghanistan? And I don't know. I don't know that anyone knows that. But the immediate kind of posture has been the reason why it's this ugly is because Biden messed it up. And I don't know if we're in a position where anyone knows that for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I w- with what I have seen, I mean, 
the way things shook out over the last few days tells me with with almost certainty this was not because of some lack of a few notifications or kind of like you know you didn't you didn't mention something to this guy or that guy this is something far more total and profound right for it to fall apart this fast um I, two points that I, I think that is right that there is a there is an appetite look th- there is a there is a dynamic in the in the press today that they were really hard on Trump for a lot of reasons because he was a disaster and so you kind of want to prove your bona fides that you weren't anti-Trump you were just calling it as you saw it right so there's some of that but I think more than that at least in my mind what we're seeing is elite opinion-forming, D.C.-based political journalism is really tied into the foreign policy establishment, think tank community, the Pentagon, that just has muscle memory about you just keep doing this stuff. And one thing, I think it was Matt Iglesias who mentioned this, and it's true, the foreign policy elite of both parties have favored continued involvement in Afghanistan. Really, pretty much both parties. Um, It's it's not like Republican, it's, it's, it's more an elite expert foreign policy establishment versus the public who kind of is done with it. And um, for a lot of kind of sociological reasons, the elite DC press is really those are their folks. Those are their people. And that shapes this coverage. Another thing, which is more, I think, something we can sympathize with on a human level, a lot of these people met people in Afghanistan. You had the, you know, when you were embedded with this kind of uh, military, uh, you know, formation, and there was an interpreter, and you know that guy, or someone who works in an NGO. And that's, that's real. If you know someone now who's trying to get out and is in danger and their family's in danger, that's real. And uh, that is also going to shape people's perspective. Um, you know, there's a lot uh, there's there's a lot going on there. And um, I think we have to kind of, you know, uh, uh, process all of this. I I I you know, there's a lot. And I think th- those things all, all figure in. I, you know, my, my sense is, is that this could not have gone much differently. And I, I will say this, another, there's one other thing to keep in mind about this. You talk about 20 years, but there was another decision point about 10 years ago when Barack Obama ran for president one of the sort of the premises of what he was going for was, A, Iraq is a disaster. Let's get out of Iraq. And both to sort of pair that and say, hey, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a wuss. You know, I want to get out of Iraq, but I'm still a tough guy. I want to redouble in Afghanistan. But it wasn't just that. It wasn't just positioning. It was also there were a lot of people, and, and certainly in 2002, 2003, I was in this category, of – Let's, why are we starting another war in Iraq when we're we're still trying to figure out what we're doing in in Afghanistan? Afghanistan is where the kind of the problem really originated from, for all the way back to nine eleven. Both of those things were going on. In any case, Barack Obama came in, sort of hawkish on Afghanistan. And after a couple of years, when things kind of still weren't working, they wanted to get out, and the Pentagon basically rolled him when he wanted to get out and they kind of made it sound really scary and he folded. And Joe Biden was on the other side of that debate. Now remember, Joe Biden at the time had a kid who who had deployed to Iraq. I don't think Bo Biden was ever in Afghanistan, but you know, still the exposure to this experience. And it seems clear and this is this has been reported on in other places 
that was a pretty shaping thing for Biden. And I suspect it shaped how he went about this of not saying, okay, we're not going to do sort of like, we'll see how, we'll try to get out and we'll see how it goes. Like, we're done. We're totally done. And whatever happens, we're still done. And look, Joe Biden's the president. The buck stops with him. He's responsible. He's president. This isn't about Trump. But I do think that is a big part of how we got to here. And I think Biden remembers that. And I think Biden knows it would have been a lot better if we would have left in 2011, 10 years ago. I don't know how many, uh, you know, American military uh, service members have died and been injured since then. And remember, it's not just people who are in the formal military. There's a whole kind of paramilitary of, of you know, contractors and stuff like that, ex-military. They get killed. We don't kind of add them to the same numbers. But um, I think a lot of people are trying to have it both ways. And when I saw the domestic, D.C. reaction to this, it was really clear. This is why we've been here for 20 years. Because no one was willing to, to, to steal themselves for this moment, which is ugly. And it is, it does not show us in a great light. Not because we're leaving, but because of just everything we, all the things that went on, you know, into the last 20 years. And that denial is why we've been there for 20 years. Well, and I think that's part of why the reactions made me so mad, both the ones that were, we should stay there forever, and the ones that are like, not now, we should leave, but not now, which is, to, in my mind, those are the same responses, just one is not willing to own it, is just the subtext there is, I'm comfortable putting this out of sight, out of mind. I don't have a personal stake, so I would rather avoid the suffering that we're going to see now in exchange for the quieter continued suffering of 10 more years of being there, 20 more years of being there. And I think the fact that people are kind of coalescing around that is the reasonable, the reasonable defense is just, it's, it's completely disingenuous and callous. I think, I think it's callous to say that you're fine with this continuing with our, our presence there continuing, but you're not fine with what we're seeing now because those two things are, are very intertwined and people were suffering while we were there as well. It's not just now. So I don't know. It also, I I think it's going to be interesting to see the reaction to when it comes down to resettling the refugees from, you know, from this crisis, because I also think, a thing that everyone is saying right now is, you know, or people in this everybody. mindset. Yeah. We we have a responsibility to our friends, you know, to our allies. And as soon the first time I saw someone tweet that, I'm like, well, yeah, but how in the world do you differentiate who's our friend, who's our ally, who's an innocent? I mean, he, most of the most people in the country are not doing anything wrong. So how in the world do you kind of make that divide? It's kind of, it's what you said earlier. Is it everyone who we've ever waved at? You know, it's just how, you know, what does that responsibility encompass? And specifically for the United States with our incredibly problematic history of immigration and our, you know, complete lack of um, ability to get immigration reform passed. I mean, how does that even play into this equation? Yeah, I mean, to me, I, I think um, anybody who worked for, in the literal sense, worked for the U.S. government. You were a translator. You were a clerk. You worked in, you know, you worked in one of our military installations as a, you know, in in whatever way. Those people, I think we should offer them asylum. Not just asylum. We should offer to resettle them in the United States. That is, that's probably a lot of people. And I, I do think we owe those people. Now, but to your point, I mean, it's a big country. There's a lot of people who are endangered in 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 various ways, and that is that's a whole other. Um, you know, we're not going to resettle the whole country. Um, I do. I mean, to me, at least, at least it is clear cut. And and again, we know the people who work for us, like literally work for us, right? We know those people, 
and um, the logistics of that are going to be pretty complicated. I will say this. You know, we now have, I think it's up to 7,000 troops that are basically all seem to be going there to garrison the military part of the international airport. Now, what that tells me is that they can hold that pretty much indefinitely. I mean, 7,000 troops, a lot of troops. That's like twice the number we had in the whole country a month ago, something like that. So I think it is a basic uh logistic and moral question are we going to basically say to ourselves and to the new government we are going to we're going to be here for a few weeks as we you know bring out the people who are now in danger because they work for us um i think i think we should do that just as a basic matter of um, ethics and morality and doing what's right, it, 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 it will make the whole thing protracted. It'll create more pictures like we're seeing, more iconic pictures. But I think we should do it because it's the right thing to do. And I think that we, have, we, um, we're go we are placing a sufficiently large military footprint in, in the country right now that I think we can. That's a lot of people. That's a, that's, that's a lot of, uh, uh, that's a lot of soldiers and airmen and, you know, military personnel in there. But I agree. I'm sure that as soon as, as soon as they're here showing up in th these, these Afghan, you know, uh, uh, interpreters and their families, as sure, as, as soon as they are showing up in local communities, yes, the same anti-immigration folks will be talking about you know, radical Islam and, and, all, you know, all the rest. Um, but look, this is, uh, again, my big takeaway when I saw this, and again, maybe it's paradoxical or maybe it's whatever, is I think President Biden decided this was necessary and the right thing to do, even realizing that it could, that it could, it was not going to be easy or a kind of an obvious political winner for him, but that it was the right thing for the country to do and in the country's best interests. Uh, and it's, I think at least it is, um, we should try to evacuate as many of those people as possible, that group of people. Um, you know, I, I hear a lot about the fate of women in the country. Yes, that is really bad. We're not going to exfiltrate the entire, you know, female, uh, female population of the, of the country. That's not going to happen. And at the end of the day, a lot of people come up with superficially engaging reasons why we should continue to militarily occupy countries forever. And those reasons pretty universally don't tend to be good reasons. That's my take. Yeah. I did just want to kind of say quickly on the, the domestic politics front, because I did see some piece uh, that was kind of getting dunked on a lot, but it was basically about how Republicans are now going to, this is going to be a big political cudgel. Like they just, you know, Biden just handed them this great political weapon. Uh, is this like Crystal him, Lizard or against. something or? Um, I think it was on Washington Post, I believe, but um, in my kind of impression, I guess barring some big immigration event, I could see that creating politically relevant shockwaves, but whoever really thinks that kind of this, this pullout, you know, what we're seeing now is going to resonate into the, into the midterms, I'm just like, kind of what are you smoking i mean americans have shown for the past 20 years a very low level of interest or care about the war in afghanistan in general and kind of the idea to me that what's going to trickle down to you know to most to people who aren't politically engaged as kind of like we left afghanistan is going to be this big you know hobble to to biden where he's he signed away the future of the democratic electoral uh, promise and you're just like what are you talking about come on that's silly there's where is the basis of 
kind of fact in that, at least to me. That seemed like a, a pretty ludicrous take. I mean, m- military defeat can be pretty damaging, mm-hmm. even if it's not your defeat, even if it's not your fault. So I, I don't, I, I don't say with any great confidence what the political, maybe the political fallout will be really bad. I don't know. I suspect, though, that what we are seeing is this is establishment D.C. and the foreign policy establishment's reaction to this. We have not heard the country's response, and we're not going to know that for a little while. And I suspect that that response is going to be pretty different. And I don't know if it's going to be people saying, wow, Joe Biden, Joe Biden rocks, love Joe Biden. I think it'll be more kind of like, yeah, why were we there in the first place? Right. Like, like that that was a little fucked up, but like, I'm glad we're out. And, and, and more than anything else, the irony and maybe the tragedy of this is that why I suspect the public will not care that much about this it's the same reason that we, why we ended up being able to stay there for 20 years. Because it's just out of sight and out of mind for most people. It's just not what they care about. If you are in that kind of, you know, D.C. political foreign policy, uh, doing embeds with, you know, kind of military formations in Iraq and Afghanistan, it's, that's where you live. That's a big thing. I don't think it's a big thing for most of the country. And we'll see. I also, I hear your point on military defeat. I just don't, in this kind of war, I don't know what a victory looks like. I don't know what a defeat looks like. It seems to me that we're in the same situation now, basically, that we were when we first got there. I just, I don't know. Like, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. It just, I don't know. I don't, yeah. Substantively, I agree with you. I think that that when you leave and the people you were fighting are in the, are in the presidential yeah. palace, that's things for people. But yeah. again, I don't think um, I don't think the country's response is going to be DC's response. And what we've been hearing so far has been DC's response. Right. But again, who knows? Yeah. It's you a can't, weird you day. can't yeah, you can't um, and again, this is this is kind of like why I I don't know, this has made me have more respect for Joe Biden. Because, like, you don't know what the political fallout's going to be. And, you know, Barack Obama could not, w- would not bite that bullet. He wouldn't. And uh, a lot of other people wouldn't either. Uh, and there you go. Okay, well, look, uh, that is our, <laughs> I'm not sure I want to call it a special episode, um it, it's there's there's nothing special about it but off the uh off the calendar and we will be back for the regular episode on wednesday so we'll talk to you then yeah thanks for being with us today all right later